13 and 14. 13 is about delivery or your presentation style and then it kind of naturally leads into chapter 14 which is how do you use what you can visually see in a presentation such as PowerPoints or things that are in your hand which we'll refer to as props uh, for example for your next speech the demonstration speech I anticipate that a lot of you will have properties that you're using um, if you're going to show us how to cook something you might bring in um, cookies for us to share or if you're going to teach us how to throw a football and you want to bring a football into class so the presentation of that looking confident while you teach us how to demonstrate an, a process uh, is important. We want to have confidence in you. If a doctor comes in and says, you know, I'm here, I'm going to deliver your baby, and then they're not poised, they're not articulate, then I might change my mind before that procedure. No matter how long that person has been delivering babies, no matter how good they are at delivering babies, there's a certain amount of trust that's built just by the way that you use your body language, just by the way that you present yourself. So if today feels a little bit superficial, I want to send you back to that video that you just watched from Ted. The way that we use our bodies is a reflection of our psychology. So we learn to trust people based on the way that they stand, based on how confidently they move throughout the space. So it can seem a little bit superficial, but its superficiality is often that reflection of what's going on on a deeper level. So we as presenters want to avoid distracting mannerisms. We want to avoid uh, miscommunication. And so we need to use our bodies well, and we need to use our presentational aids well. So that'll be kind of what we're talking about today. The other video that I wa asked you to watch was a stand-up comedian, and he's showing all the things that are wrong with PowerPoint. And I just, I have to do that off the front end because we've all been frustrated with PowerPoint. I've been frustrated with PowerPoint, and I love PowerPoint. I use it on a daily pa basis. But we know that there are some ways to do things and there are some really wrong choices but there are a lot of right choices with PowerPoint. I have a lot of students ask me um, about every little detail. I'm not going to micromanage your PowerPoint slides. Uh, I think there's, as my daddy would say, more than one way to skin a cat. So if your methodology is different from mine, so be it. My favorite method is presentation zen, which means I only have a few things on the slide and it's not the main thing. The main thing is my message, right? I don't want to rely too heavily on the slides. So anyway, uh, let's get started for the day. We're going to look at page 166. So I've turned there. So we've already touched on this, but you are tasked with speaking extemporaneously which means that you've got some notes there to refer back to, but in general, you're not reading a whole lot, right? You may read a quote by Abraham Lincoln, but we're not going to sit and didactically memorize our manuscript and deliver it from memory, and we're also not going to just stand up there and read, and that includes reading from our slides. We want to have a conversation. The other thing we're not doing is we're not making up this speech as we go because otherwise we'll have lots of ums and huhs and hmms or big long pauses between your next thought. We want to have a nice flow of information and have a prepared talk that is honest and in the moment, authentic. So I often put good flow, which is sort of a rapper term, but what I mean by that is that you understand your content well enough that just like joy riding down a hill, you don't even have to put your foot on the gas. If you are well studied and you know what you're talking about, you often have a good rate. When I write um, you're talking too slow, it's often that you have big pauses between your thoughts because you haven't really prepared what you're going to say. Now. Rate is highly preferential and personal. 
I can talk fast. I can talk to somebody else who talks fast. I love watching the Gilmore Girls because they talk fast. Um, if you're from the South, if I were to impersonate a Southern accent, most Southern accents are a little slower than your average accent, right? So some of you who are from different parts of America rather than the South, you might get a little frustrated with how slow we sometimes talk. So rate is individual. If you're talking way too fast, remember that's part of that fight, flight, or freeze instinct. You're trying to fly through your presentation just to get it over with because your adrenaline is pumping and you just want to finish. And we don't communicate effectively when we're just brushing over and finishing our talk. So those are just some things to think about. Pause can be used effectively for emphasis, but we want to avoid talking like William Shatner, right? If we put too many pauses in our speech patterns, we lose momentum and we lose that flow. So if you see on your feedback form, your um, good flow, that means I really like your pace. You've got a clear train of thought and you're, you're moving right along. Volume. So this is a reference to Sister Act, which kind of dates me, I know. But Whoopi Goldberg uh, inspires the redhead there on your right to sing and belt to the back of the class. And for most of my students, when you're having a trouble with volume, you're not talking loud enough, it's not physical. It's not that you don't have the capability to talk louder, it's that you're shrinking back from your audience. So I want to challenge you to speak on your breath, right? Don't don't be so breathless or let your breath lose you. Make sure you have your breath underneath you and then speak on your voice and speak to the back row. Imagine that those sound waves are reaching us in the back. If you think about projecting and having a full and resonant voice, you're usually going to clearly connect with us. It's when you're shying away often that we don't hear your full resonant voice. So, and I always have to admit, y'all know I'm a loud talker. <laughs> Sometimes I can do what's called pushing, which is to talk too loud at my audience. I get excited <laughs> and I'm very Southern. And so uh, there are occasionally times when we're talking too loud. And I might write that. Usually what I'll write on your form, feedback form, is you're pushing. And by that I mean um, don't get so excited that you're yelling at us. Uh, keep your voice in check. Bye bye This is a sketch from SNL from the 90s with David Spade. And as, as the airplane passengers are leaving, he would say, bye 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 now, bye bye <laughs> And it was very, very fake. Often, pitch is another one of those protective instincts. We see the muscles in your face tightening into a mask. And that tension in the corners of your mouth is what often makes that high-pitched fake noise. Have you ever walked into a place where you were supposed to be getting customer service and someone says, Hi, how are you? How are you doing today? And it just feels very fake and it feels very forced. Sometimes you can hear the lying just by the tone that they choose, unfortunately. So pitch is, we obviously don't want to be fake sounding. We don't want to put on that fake voice. We want to speak on our, as naturally as possible. So if I say you sound sing-songy, that often means that your pitches are repetitive. So you may think of pitch as something particular to singing, and she's singing on pitch or she's singing off pitch, but we speak in pitches as well. When I say speak in clear, resonant, and dulcet tones, dulcet means musical, right? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, right? I'm changing my pitches, and most of us naturally have dulcet tones, so embrace that stay conversational, stay connected to us, and try to avoid going into something that sounds more fake. Like, I was going to the store, and then I stopped to get some milk. Could you hear how that pitch is repetitive? Right? So, be natural. I know it's difficult when your nerves are uh, shaking you up, but as much as possible, 
try to think of us as just people you're connecting to. So Kim Kardashian does this thing where she kind of gravelly sits on her voice. We in communication call that vocal fry. And once again, that's a matter of attitude rather than um, physiology. There's nothing in Kim Kardashian's throat that makes her sort of monotone and uh, sitting on her tones, right? Um, most of the time when people do this, it's what we in the um, communication world would call an affectation. An affectation, the same way that snooty British people roll their R's, right? Uh, that affectation is to in make, it's a status symbol, basically. So when they are rolling their R's or when you're experiencing vocal fry, it's a trend, just like a handbag, a trendy clothing that you would wear. It's a trend in vocalization. And it doesn't mean we can't have fun with our voices. We just want to have fun with our voices in a way that's professional, within the professional environment. And people who practice vocal fry in like a an interview there's actually been studies you can go google it uh, there's a trend of these women who are kind of picking up on this Kim Kardashian vocal fry and they're less likely to be hired based on the university studies that are being conducted currently as I record this so when you go into an interview or professional environment please speak naturally in as much as possible because affectations while they may be cool in the club not that cool in the classroom okay so what's a mondegrin a mondegrin is a when someone says something wrong and so people they don't articulate enough so like when somebody says supposedly instead of suppo supposedly so we always want to hit those consonants and articulate and enunciate our words. This, especially if you have a southern accent, you might be um, tempted to say, um, next thing you know, she hit the flow, show to got low. Uh, a fl flow should not roam, rhyme uh, naturally with low, right? <laughs> she should hit the floor. We want to hit those end R, uh, R there, that end consonant. Uh, if you've ever heard James Earl Jones speak, you can hear how he really hits every end consonant. Now, there's actually a logic to his reasoning, and he knows his instrument. He has a very deep and resonant voice, a very low bass, like a bass like when you're riding in a car and you can feel that bass, right, in the car. That, that bass voice those of you who speak in a lower registry, it's actually harder to hear those consonants. So if you have a really high pitched voice, it's harder for you to project the same way that a big old bass cello, when you play that bass cello, you don't need an amplifier. A violin, on the other hand, is a small instrument and it needs an amplifier. So. I know I'm geeking out on you guys and telling you all these things you don't need to know, but sound production is fascinating to me. Uh, I would never want to go back to school and get a doctorate in physics in order to understand sound projection, but it's just so interesting how when someone opens their mouth, we expect a certain vocal tone out of them based on their appearance, and sometimes it's surprisingly different from what we see or expect. Um, you know, we see someone with a really low voice who's really small it seems it seems confusing in our minds so anyway uh, please articulate uh, the word mondegrins comes from uh, a Scottish people being misunderstood and after having traveled in Scotland I can kind of understand that <laughs> there was a famous lyric that was um, misinterpreted by the British and it was a Scottish um, it was a Scottish song, and the actual Scottish phrase was, lay me down on the greens. 
<laughs> which is a dirty reference. Um, but but the British, you know, naively thought they said Mondegrin. So when you hear that word Mondegrin, it just means that someone's saying pacifically instead of specifically or intensive purposes rather than for all intents and purposes. So if you know that it's a Mondegrin that you're tempted to say wrong, just avoid putting them into your speech. Um, avoid words that you're not sure of how to say correctly. And I will correct your Mondegrins because I want to make sure that when you go into professional environment someone doesn't judge you. Remember we said the Henry Higgins of the world will judge you. I want to make sure that you're judged by your work and not being misinterpreted by your grammar. Okay, uh, pronunciation. So just for the record, my name is Seal. There's no S on the end of it. It's not Miss Seals. There's only one seal. It's not multiple aquatic animals. So make sure when you ask someone their name that you're putting the stress on the right syllable right? We're stressing the correct syllable. Um, no one wants to be meeting with their heart surgeon and have them mispronounce cardiac, right? <laughs> it questions your credibility on a topic if you don't pronounce well. Uh, I had a student who was giving a debate and he kept saying um, contrapositives instead of saying contraceptives. Now I think that was partially that he shouldn't have picked a topic that was sexual if he was going to be uncomfortable talking about sexuality and part of that manifesting, that, that discomfort manifesting itself was with mispronunciation. So we want to be well studied. We want to always look up our words and how to pronounce them. Now pronunciation is often regional, but we do have an in uh, an international phonetic alphabet. I, I can actually look up the IPA way to say something if you have a question. You know, is it New Orleans? Is it Nolens? Is it New Orleans? Uh, I can actually go look at what is like the American newscaster way to pronounce something. So if you're having trouble with pronunciation, you can see me or see an expert in your field. For example, if you're going to pay tribute to uh, the heart and you don't know how to say aorta, you may want to go to your professor who teaches that or uh, you know watch some video clips. But I'll be happy to help you with pronunciation, but I also will be taking off points if you mispronounce something because you as a communicator need to be understood. So Shakespeare once said, the apparel oft proclaims the man. That was from Hamlet. And when your credibility is in question, if you're doing a persuasive speech, if you're trying to buy someone, there's a reason that in sales we really need to dress up. Uh, because part of your credibility, as she said in the video, if you crossing the street, you're more likely to cross the street behind someone in a tie. It's just the real world. It's just um, perceived statuses. So I would encourage you to wear your best outfit. I know for some of you your best outfit is the pair of jeans that don't have holes in them and I I understand that I'm not going to take off points because you're wearing jeans but I would encourage you to wear hard-soled shoes. They'll make you feel more powerful. Your Sunday dress shoes, your uh, high heels, your um, nice leather shoes will actually make you stand up taller. And I know that seems kind of weird, uh, but trust me, there's a tradition of dressing for the part you want. So dress a little nicer than you think you need to dress when you're giving any kind of presentation, but especially the persuasive speech posture posture so my mother always used to say to me shoulders back in this um, Emily Post kind of voice you know about being proper and I was resented that because I'm a very tall person and I always like to slump over to feel less tall but there is a lot of truth in holding yourself high First of all, the things she said in that video about the way you present yourself, obviously. But the second one is even more important to me, which is being centered. If I have my weight on both of my feet, and I have both of my hips sitting over my feet, and I have my shoulders over my hips, and I have my knees relaxed, and all of those little stones lining up on top of each other, 
I'm going to be less likely to fall over, right? I'm going to be balanced and centered. I need to have my breath underneath me. If I'm standing up nice and tall, my ribs have plenty of room to expand. Some of you who are right on your feedback form, you're breathless. That's actually a matter of you not having sometimes enough room to breathe, as I experienced when I was pregnant. Couldn't, there was, the baby was, you know, taking up a lot of room and my ribs couldn't expand enough to get my breath underneath me. Some of you are so slumped over and so folded in on yourself that your lungs aren't working properly. So if you expand your chest and roll your shoulders back and put your ears right over your shoulders, your ears should be centered. And oh, it's hard for me not to do this talk without, I'm doing all these gestures you guys can't see. (laughs) Oh, well. Trust me about your placement. You want to have your chin back and your ears over your shoulders, right? It can be a little bit physically exhausting, and I don't want you to be rigid, but I want you to get into the habit of start starting to embrace the expansiveness of your rib cage in order to breathe properly. Eye contact, eye contact, eye contact. I feel like I say this every lecture, how important it is to connect with your audience. This is a movie, The Incredibles, and the daughter is an adolescent, and she has hair in her face. And when she embraces her super uh, powers, she moves her hair out of her face. And that was my only complaint about that video is that the speaker had her hair in her face for part of the time. And it wasn't bad. Some of my students will seriously have as much hair in their face as this picture on the left. And that is unacceptable because it hinders eye contact. And I'll have students come to my office and they're like, why do you care about my hair do? Uh, you just don't like my hair do. No, it really is that I can't see your beautiful face and I need uh, part of my interpretation of your message is going to be based on your body language and your facial eye contact and reading your facial expressions and I can't do that if you have on a hat over your eyes or if you have hair in your face or if you're chewing gum all of those things hinder your message they distract from your message so we want to throw the gum away tuck the bangs behind the ear or at least push them back out of your face We want to stand tall and share our message. Okay, I have a lion (laughs) as the picture here because lions stalk their prey. They pace back and forth while they're watching their prey. And some of you, as you give your speech, you'll be tempted to pace back and forth or shift your feet back and forth. Now, part of that is that same instinct that we have in rocking a baby to sleep, that constant motion. But part of that instinct is also predatory. Remember we said fight, flight, uh, or freeze? Some of you are fighters, and you are stalking us as an audience, pacing back and forth and staring us down. It's a dominant gesture that's distracting. So try to be intentional with your movement. As I've said before, you start in one area of the room, and then when you change your thought, move to another. So we talked about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. First, he's a poet, so I might stand over by the door. And then as I change into talking about him as a prophet, I might walk back and stand in front of the podium. And that transition of my placement in the room reminds my audience of my different changing of my um, message or, you know, moving along to another part. And then when I'm finished talking about him, As a prophet, I might walk back to the center of the room to conclude my speech. So move with intention. I have students ask me all the time, what do I do with my hands? Or what's wrong with my hand motions? In general, I would just say, are they intentional? Are they distracting from your message or are they adding to it? Okay. So the one on the far left is freeze. Right? Some of you, when you stand in front of the class, you freeze up and you recite your speech and you go back and you sit down and your mouth doesn't move and your face doesn't move and your hands don't move and you're frozen, just like Anna in the movie Frozen. We don't want to do that. Our bodies help share that message. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have excessive gesturing and I have a big old cow there uh, because 
when you're a mascot in like a football game, you actually have to do these big, huge gestures in order to get the audience's attention. You can't just wave. You have to wave your hands big and around. Now, we naturally have these instincts about gestures. If I was waving my hands around at somebody in the hallway, people would assume it was an emergency, right? Or that we were about to fight. We'd probably get this circle of people around us if I started waving my hands around in the hallway because it's inappropriate. But when our adrenaline is pumping through our blood and we're, you know, so excited to give this talk, sometimes that results in over gesturing, right? So we want to try to sit into our bodies ride the wave of discomfort that may come across when we are trying to give a speech and gesture appropriately gesture in as much as it helps to add to your message now like I said before this is a continuum my husband is a little shyer he's a little more quiet he's a little more reserved he's gonna be a little bit closer to frozen I am a big old spaz and I'm excitable and I'm energetic I'm gonna be a little bit closer to the cow so it's a continuum and it's not a perfect science and it's highly individual I might say that a person's gestures are fine and then you might get to writing their critique paper and say you know what they're really not fine I think you're over gesturing that's a matter of preference and I'm not going to correct that on your paper because it's your preference and you're entitled to your preference um, but I think that there's a lot of green in this continuum there's a lot of gestures that are okay so don't beat yourself up about f gestures don't overthink it focus on your message and let the natural body language come trust your body and um, only correct yourself if you see yourself doing something way out of bounds okay okay <laughs> transition here so we are moving into chapter 14 <laughs> uh, I made that line graph as a joke and it's it's kind of one of those jokes that's probably not funny uh, <laughs> I know I have a lot of student loan debt and it does seem to grow exponentially every year like oh I'm gonna you know I'm gonna pay more than my minimum payments this year and Oh, money. I hate money. But anyway, a line graph, it um, depicts changes among variables over time. So the line graph, you can see this one, over time it keeps growing and growing as the interest rates grow. So that's the purpose of a line graph. If you're going to choose between the graphs on page 182, if it's related to time, choose a line. The second one is a bar graph. This is to compare variables, um, quantitative comparison among variables. So if you um, are comparing one person's salary to another person's salary, one person is the coolest, uh, one is less cool, then you would make a bar graph. And finally, there is the pie or circle graph. And a pie gram shows the relative proportions, right? how much pumpkin pie you get so please anytime you're tempted to make a diagram refer back to page 182 now I will say when we get into um, researched assignments such as the informative and the persuasive the amount of data is really can be overwhelming to an audience and we'll talk about that a lot of people in your audience are more math phobic than you would realize and so I highly encourage making these graphs they really don't take a lot of time when I make them in PowerPoint um, you just kinda gotta get in there and play with it but it's really it's a very intuitive I think the um, PowerPoint graph software is graph um, I don't know the right word to use the interface is pretty accessible and uh, you know sometimes you can find these graphs online but always cite a graph because it has data in it it's not the same as me just like showing a picture of a cow right <laughs> that cow is, is anybody could have taken that picture but a graph has numbers and data that comes from and usually a institution of research or a college so make sure that you cite your graphs if you get them off the internet alright so moving on to other types of aids besides um, graphs objects 
right? So I said you might have a football and you're going to teach us how to play football. Pictures, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, diagrams or things that show parts of a whole, maybe a picture of the skeletal system with labels of, okay, this is your neck bone connected to your hip bone, you know. Okay, we already went over that. And charts condensing the information. So once again, just a picture is worth um, many, many words. Maps are great. So if you use any sort of audio or video, I, for the purposes of my course, we want to keep it Instagram short. It can only be 30 seconds. You, it's not, that's not a rule of thumb, like when you get into professional presentations or if you're going to become a teacher or something, I'm not saying 30 seconds is, um, what you should always do, but for the purposes of our course, it just helps you from relying too heavily on any one resource, okay? We want to give balanced speeches and we want to um, include multiple sources rather than just replicating what a video, one video tells us, right? We want to gather information from lots of different places. Now some people ask me for the tribute speech, can I have like an underscore if I pay tribute to Billie Holiday, can I play the song the whole time I'm giving a speech? And I've never seen it done well. It's almost always a distraction from the message, trying to have an underscore or trying to have one of those PowerPoint slides that automatically changes slide. That's a huge, what we'd say in theater, upstaging you. People are just going to watch those slides change. So I really would encourage you to manually change your PowerPoints and to only show a short video, 30 second video. So um, handouts are okay. Handouts are good, but just be careful. Because if you hand the handout before you speak and then you immediately start speaking, people are going to be reading rather than listening to you speak. So be careful with handouts. Uh, you know, I've had people pay tribute to the Shriners and then at the end of their speech give us little tri-folded um, pamphlets that came from the Shriners. And that's great. It gives us a homework assignment to go look at those um, websites or look at the pictures but I would wait till after you give your speech to give back your to hand out your handouts because if you do it during your speech you're likely to once again be upstaged by your handout or pamphlet. All right so pictures I just want to talk for a moment about the importance of pictures. People say why do you require any PowerPoints? Why even bother with PowerPoints? And I would say that PowerPoint is a valuable tool, and that's all it is, is a tool, in order to help clarify your message. So I might say to you, I have a Boston Terrier. She has a white stripe down her face. She has those kind of ears that stick up. But if I just show you a picture of my Boston Terrier, it's a lot easier, right? It's a lot quicker. It's a lot clearer. And um, now you're gonna might be tempted to use pictures to evoke an emotional reaction. That's good, but be careful. There's a lot of research out there about graphic images and what it can do. Um, it was very controversial. For example, in the Boston Marathon, a man had his um, legs blown off, and there was a picture circulating the internet of that. And that was very um, hurtful to the family of that victim. It was also disrespectful in a sense. Uh, that person had just been through something horrific. And to have that publicly disseminated. The other thing that they're really finding is the effect it has on our psyche. So I want to challenge you if you're looking at a lot of graphic images. And I'm not talking about like CGI video games or something. I'm talking about real pictures of war or of um, crime scenes. I just want to warn you that that really could have a lasting effect on your brain chemistry and, and that research is out there. Go look it up. Um, but all that to say, this is not a big scary image. I just, there are worse pictures I could have found 
Now, if there are graphic images in your presentation, you need to tell us before it starts so that the people who are likely to be offended by that can go sit out in the hall. Um, I myself might cover my eyes. I don't have to look at graphic images. I don't want to. Um, I do not respect it when people show abortion pictures. I had a baby personally, and that was a very beautiful and scary experience for me. So um, throwing images of, you know, these mangled fetuses is not, um, is something that I think is disrespectful to human life. So please be careful about shock value. I talked about that a little bit for your first assignment. We don't want to shock our audience because it's often that means they'll close their ears. So some of you use pictures just to express your personality. That's fun. I encourage that. So anytime you're thinking, is this working? Is this not working? Ask yourself, is this aiding my speech? We call them presentation aids. Do they aid or do they hinder? Are they hinder and help? The moment the visual appears on the screen, the audience will focus on the visual rather than listening to what you're saying, <laughs> right? Anytime that they start to see those words, too many words, they're going to sit there and read it as you often are uh, in my class if I use too many words. So stick to the point. Communication is key. I have found page 254 to be so helpful. Wonderful so uh, summation. Now, 254, that's not right. That's not right, is it? No. That's not right. One ninety one, page one ninety one. Sorry, I forgot to change that slide. Page one ninety one has some great visual aid uh, information. So, never turn your back on your audience. We talked about that. Try to only reveal one thought at a time, right? As I have done here, or put one thought on one PowerPoint slide. We talked about singularity last class, right? only trying to say one thing at a time. If you try to say too many things at once, you're just going to confuse and muddy the issue. So try to try to say one thing at a time and make it clear. As just a rule of thumb, if you're trying to fit more than six words on the line, that's probably though your font is going to be too small to read by the back of the class. So keep your font nice and large so we can clearly see it. And also we're going to try not to have too many lines of information on one page, right? So the idea is not throwing too many words at your audience. And this is just a rule of thumb. I'm not likely to sit there and count how many words you have on a slide, particularly if they're small words. But in general, it needs to be nice and big and be ready to be seen in the back of the class. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is an appropriate font for third graders, right? Times New Romance. Um, but if you're going to give a serious talk, you need to have a serious presentation style. If you're going to give a silly talk, you can have a silly presentation style. But I have seen people give talks about cancer and have their eyes dotted with hearts, right? We don't need to make that mistake. If you want to be taken seriously, you need to present yourself in a way that's serious. Please, please, please avoid putting colored backgrounds. We want to have a lot of contrast, so either black letters, white background, or black background, white letters. We need to be able to see um, what the words are on the screen, so try to keep a lot of contrast in your presentations. Don't put your words over your pictures unless you're labeling a chart or graph. We don't want to confuse and muddy. It's just hard to read them. Oh, I love this slide. The one in the bottom with the little ears back. He's so little. Oh, so distracting. So if you're going to talk about puppies, just give us a puppy um, and not one that's so cute it's distracting from your talk, right? Or change the slide often so we're not tempted to be distracted. 
<laughs> All right, so we want to avoid using the bottom third of the slide. If you're using the bottom third of the slide, then the people in the front row, um, their head might be, you might have to like look around their head in order to see what's on the slide. So to avoid that, put all of the content in the top third, two thirds of the PowerPoint slide rather than the very bottom. So I'm trying to get better about this, but it's often my mistake that I make. Prezi is a great presentation tool if you uh, haven't looked into Prezi, especially if you're in sales. Um, it's a great tool. So just want to encourage you. I don't use Prezi. I love PowerPoint and have used it for a long time. And I am an old dog with old tricks. Um, but if you can learn new tricks, Prezi is a great tool. Um, I would say that you do need to know how to use it on your own because although I can sort of troubleshoot, um, it, it can be kind of a glitchy program because it is free and um, you get what you pay for in some cases. So anyway, that's my two cents on presentation media. I know some of you are going to rock at this. You're graphic designers. You find wonderful pictures. Uh, you're going to have plenty of contrast between your words and your backgrounds. You're going to use your presentation media in order to enhance your me message. And remember, you can give a great speech without a single piece of technology. People did it for years and years and years. They stood beside a tree and they said, life is a lot like this tree right here. Right? And they just used their surroundings in order to better communicate. So it's nothing new. And um, if you just want to use the Elmo and put pictures up on the Elmo, um, that's okay. But you might be robbing yourself of some useful options. I'll just say it that way. Especially when it comes to memory. If you know, I won't let you hold a whole bunch of note cards, but PowerPoint may help you remember what to say next. So if you are intimidated by it, I can work with you in my office. You can play around with it in the library or any of the computers. All of them have Microsoft Office um, Outlook and PowerPoint and all that on them. So get on the school computer and start playing because um, I don't see any hint that presentation media is going away anytime soon. So as always, thank you for listening.